Coming up on this week's episode of TechSnap, find out how the 2012 Olympics are preparing for cyber war, and we'll answer a great batch of your questions, plus Alan's rather embarrassing tech war story. All that and more on this week's episode of TechSnap. Hi everyone and welcome to TechSnap. This is our 36th episode and it was streamed live on December 15th and released for download on December 16th, 2011. This episode is brought to you by GoDaddy.com and I'll tell you more about them as the show goes on. And the live stream is powered by ScaleEngine.com, which is awesome. Yes. My name is Chris and joining me every single week, you just heard him, it's the man, the legend, the myth. Alan Jude. Hey there, Alan. <laughs> hey, Chris. <laughs> I decided to change it up a little bit. I didn't uh, know I was a myth. <laughs> well, you became a myth. Uh, you, you know, you're, you're about, you might be a myth in these parts around here. A little bit of a legend. Okay. Um, awesome. So look, uh, we're having a good time. We have a big show today. We've got some we good, good news stories to sink our teeth into, but uh, it is the season. Sometimes tech news is a little light. That doesn't matter because Alan's throwing in a war story and we've got some great Q&A plus yes, an epic roundup. And something else that's actually kind of historic that's happening right now as we record this show is the uh, SOPA hearings are underway in a uh, committee where they're, uh, they're calling up the markup committee. Or, or I'm not sure if that's what's still in progress here, but that was going on earlier this, this afternoon where they're working out and hashing out some of the finer details of SOPA. And each person who's really for it is pitching their case and the people that are against it are pitching their um, case, and we'll kind of keep you updated on what we discover. I've got a little bit of an update um, in the roundup, though, on SOPA, something I think a lot of you will be particularly interested in, so stay mm -hmm. tuned for that. Uh, Alan, uh, is there uh, anything you want to cover before we jump right into the news? Any uh, bits up front? Uh, not really. All right, well, let's do this thing now. Uh, we should mention, too, that we do have an email address if you want to get a hold of us. It's techsnap at jupiterbroadcasting.com, and the Q&A mm -hmm. section that we'll be uh, uh, featuring later on in the show was uh, powered by uh, your emails. And we also yes. have a Reddit page over at links.techsnap.tv, and that's also a great way to either submit stories or questions for the show. All right. Well, that business out of the way, let's jump into this first story because it's one that's particularly scary. Uh, it, it, an oil company was at, a, at an event today where there was press and all sorts of people, and one of their administrators sort of revealed something that kind of shocked people there and it sort of made headlines all over the mm -hmm. world, but uh, the BBC has picked this up. What's yeah. going on here, Alan? Uh, so, well, the IT manager of Royal Dutch Shell, which is one of the biggest oil companies in the world, mm -hmm. uh, told the World Petroleum Conference uh, when they were there that the company has been receiving an ever-increasing number of cyber attacks against its infrastructure and that they're getting pretty worried about it. Oh, boy. And I imagine all of the oil companies are experiencing this, but most of them, obviously, uh, for the sake of their stock price and so on, don't want to say anything about it. Right. And so when one of them finally comes forward and says, look, we need to start taking this seriously, because, you know, especially over the last 18 months or so, things have really stepped up in this arena. It really seems so. And I've, I've, I've been questioning, is it just a stepped up media campaign to make us more aware of it? Or is it actually an increase in attacks? And it's probably both, to be honest with you. Yeah. And, Some and, are doing it for fame you know, and, and other things. Yeah. But. And sometimes you see, you know, the uh, some of the numbers they give out about the number of cyber attacks they received. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's like, uh, it's part of our next story about the Olympics that, you know... Uh, the Beijing Olympics claimed that they had like 12 million cyber attacks. Right. It's like right. you can't count each port individual scan. port that was yeah. scanned. <laughs> each port that was scanned in a yeah. port scan as an individual and, attack. And as the security contractor who's monitored mm. that stuff before, now not as my, as my own independent company, but when I worked for another contracting company, you know, you, you over-report everything because you're there. You, you're, you're there justifying the, the buck they're spending on you. So yeah. uh, if you can tell a user that a port scan of your SSH server is, is a bad thing, they, you, you do it because that's what you're doing. We, we do. blocked that. So, so, you know, if it wasn't for us, you would have been in trouble, right? Right, exactly, exactly. And then, of course, they turn that around and they, they release that. So some of it is overblown, but you got to figure some of it's probably actually legitimate. Right. And uh, so if an attacker did manage to gain access to some of their critical control systems, then, uh, like we saw with that story with the, uh, the uh, water treatment plant or whatever, mm -hmm, that turned mm -hmm. out to not have actually been a cyber attack. Right. But if it had, you know, the fact that they could manipulate valves and pumps and, and things, especially at an oil refinery or, or a, a pumping station or whatever, you know, uh, an offshore drilling rig, uh, then they could cause unimaginable damage. And, oh, I mean, economic you know, damage, all kinds of... Yeah, and of like, you know, cause an explosion that causes a fire... 
that does huge amounts of damage and, you know, coats a bunch of people in black, you know, oil smoke or whatever. And you end up with physical, monetary and huge environmental damage. I mean, I think some of this, too, is coming from the fears that were caused by what Stuxnet was capable of achieving yep. in the Iranian subterfuges. But... At the same time... Centrifuges. Uh, su- subterfuges. Sub- su- no, subterfuges. Iranian subterfuge. <laughs> yes. <laughs> They're tricking you, Alan. <laughs> yes. uh, I would say that, uh, it, first of all, just because it happened in one industry doesn't mean that the other industry's equipment is vulnerable to it. I mean, are these drills and these valves really hooked up to computers that can be... Well, yes, they're definitely they... hooked up to computers. The question is, are those computers happen to be on the Internet? Like we saw with the, with the SCADA systems at that prison... You know, the jail guards were on it browsing on their Facebook or whatever. Right. And, you know, if if the computer's being dual used like that, it's very easy for it to get malware that can eventually lead to it being remote control. Mm, I, or, I, had a, I had a client of a uh, local burger chain that um, had a master processor for all of their payments, and it was also the, brow- the computer the, the staff browsed the internet on their lunch break. Yeah. And it processed all of their transactions. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> and or we saw with um, another similar system where, you know, the the company that manages the SCADA system purposely left it open to remote control so they could remote control yeah, it to make it easier. You know, so it yeah. wouldn't be so hard in the middle. So of the that night they family. didn't have to send a rep out on site. It's like <laughs> all right then, but you know that that you don't want to just expose that on the internet. That's crap. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Man, and, so this is know, obviously a story to follow, but nothing really to sink our teeth into yet. Like, he hasn't said... Right, but okay. specifically, what I'm saying is that it's just further evidence that these type of industrial control systems need to be completely isolated from the Internet. Mm-hmm. Not just protected by some firewall that's supposed to be magical and, and, and stop all the bad stuff, but let through the good stuff, right? You know, I wonder if, as time goes on, if that, what you're saying there, which just seems so obvious when it comes to critical infrastructure, like water pumps or oil drills and things like that. I wonder, though, if that same logic will apply to more smaller operations like myself. What if, like, I got to a point where I was big enough where there was a competitor and we're down the road where people have more sophisticated malware attempts? Would we be sitting here in a few years from now or 10 years from now saying, you know, make sure none of your studio equipment is connected to the Internet, otherwise somebody might be able to get and interrupt your operations? You know, or, yeah, or, or things like, like red cameras. You know, red cameras are connected to computers while they're operated, so now when movie studios shoot films with red cameras, they're, all those cameras cameras are connected to laptops. Yep. Could, uh, you know, I mean, there's all kinds of different things we might have to start thinking of right, in ways we've that, never thought know, about having to be removed from communications before. Right. You, with, uh, with that red camera, you would want to make sure you weren't using that uh, same laptop to do your regular internet browsing because if you get a virus on that and it wipes out the hard drive, there goes all your recordings. Exactly. Right? It's an interesting thing. Also, that do you they might... even make laptops with like RAID for the hard drives? You'd want RAID if you were recording... Mm-hmm. Not just for the speed, but that you'd want to make you don't, sure you, that... You don't record to the laptop. You just use the laptop to control, control. it. But, but unlike a MacBook, you can do like a... a Promise makes a 12 terabyte Thunderbolt um, capture array yeah. that over at Thunderbolt is plenty fi- fast. Yeah. So. Uh, any other thoughts on this story? Yeah, uh, so basically I was just saying that rather than just... You know, the internet seems to have creeped into all of these systems. Like when I worked at uh, a power plant, they had the industrial control systems that ran the actual power plant were a separate, isolated Solaris right, network. Right. And then they had the regular business network of Windows machines. So at the, at the bank but, that I operated at, we had the front-end servers that had like all the terminal servers and things like that. And I think the most we got to was like 112, 115 servers that I managed. But then we also had a back-end operations of a System 390 mainframe that had its own private network. In fact, it didn't even interconnect with Ethernet or anything of the sort. It interconnected with Fiber Channel, which... If you think about how long ago, this was like almost eight years ago. So having Fiber Channel interconnected all this machinery, and it had its own private network, so that way all of the bank's really critical records would be completely separated. I mean, it was just built into the design of the infrastructure. And then if you wanted to, keep, if you wanted to bridge the gap between the two isolated networks, you would have to have a computer in between that would take requests, translate them, and move them over to this other kind of network, and then message them to the mainframe, take its specialized requests back, translate them, and then forward them back to the regular computer network. Network. Right, and that machine could do things like extra authentication checking, making sure that user is authorized yep. to make that change and so yeah, on. Yeah, and there was little token IDs with every transaction and all kinds of stuff. Yeah. Right, and you, know, you need things like that because, you know, like we've seen, you know, the, the control computer for the prison system shouldn't have been on the internet, but it was. <laughs> oh, yeah, what, what was that, like right. three episodes ago we covered that yeah. one? <laughs> and, but even if you have it completely isolated from the internet, right, like that Iranian nuclear plant, 
you know, somebody brings in Stuxnet or Dooku on, on a, a USB floppy. stick. Or, yeah, USB stick, jeez. A floppy right? drive, because I'm sure everybody's using those. So, so you need physical security, right? You want to make sure that no one is using that machine except for the people that are supposed to, mm-hmm. right? Like, for example, at the prison, it seemed that, you know, the guards and some administrative people were using the machine to browse the internet when that machine should have right. been only for unlocking and locking doors. Or like that client of mine where their payment processor was also where they check Facebook. Right. Yes, you know, should be separate. And, yep. uh, you know, it just means, seems that physical and system security need to be taken a lot more seriously than they are in a lot of these setups and corporations. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. part of it just seems to be that, you know, they hire a contractor to set up a security system and they think, all right, that's secure now. It doesn't matter if we violate the security by doing X, Y, or Z. Well, and part of it isn't they don't care either because if the security is compromised and they have something that a vendor put in, they can go often go after that vendor. You know, so they can right. they can just but defer it's, liability. It's not the vendor's fault if if you let your employees browse Facebook on their on the isolated system, right? Mm-hmm. 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 Absolutely. But yes, in the case of the prison system, it was the vendor's fault for insisting that it be connected to the internet so they could remote control it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um all right, should we move on to the uh, story you touched on about the Olympics? Yes. This is an interesting one because I guess this isn't something I'd even thought of, but uh, you, when I think of like before the Olympics and they're doing trials to make things are ready, I think of like maybe video production crews are making sure they have amazing shots of the different incredible activities yep. that'll be happening. But oh no, no, no. This time they're actually doing like cyber warfare attack scenarios for the Olympics, aren't they? I mean, this is pretty crazy stuff. Yeah, so the, the IT company that's going to run the, the control center that's going to run the website for it and handle uh, storing and, and publishing the scores and times and all that r- records and all that kind of stuff that go along with the Olympics, you know, they're making sure that they're ready uh, now, as much as they can, you know. It's like, is a simulated cyber attack ever as good as a real one? It's like, I don't know if anybody's ever tried to simulate a denial of service attack before, but it's, it's never like the real thing. They make an interesting point here in the article. They say, since the Olympic Games, the nat- since the last Olympic Games, the nature and scope of uh, cyber threats has changed substantially. A series of hacks and websites take stands orchestrated by Anonymous and Lolsec has hit uh, Austin Stages uh, corporations, including Sony, HP Gary, and the UK and US governments. So they're kind of building a case here that even just since the last Olympics, kind of like we were just saying... Right, but in- SQL injection has existed for as long as SQL has been used on a website. <laughs> yeah, good right. Point. It's not new. It's just that it gets talked about a lot more now, and that there are, you know, some tools that make it a little easier for people that aren't as savvy to pull off such an attack. Uh, but you know, it's not that cyber warfare has changed all that much. It's just that it's got more press now. Mm. True that. True that. And so uh, they've got this new uh, operation center in Canary Wharf that will be monitoring and, and managing the IT infrastructure for the 2012 Olympics in London. Uh, and the simulated attacks will include a denial of service attack against the website, uh, which they plan to mitigate by having the website actually be distributed. So rather than just being a bunch of servers at one place, Very it's nice. all over. Especially uh, The Olympics is a great example of that because it is a global event, right? Well, and that will help with load, too, because people all over the world will be clicky, clicky, clicky. So right. it's not just like, a security thing. I'm guessing they're using something like Akamai, which is a, a big global CDN. Yeah, that, yeah. And if they're using something like Anycast uh, specifically for it, that means that uh, it, when the, if it's an actually distributed denial of service attack of a bunch of machines from China or whatever, mm-hmm. then only the Anycast nodes that are in... Uh, that take the traffic for China will become overwhelmed by the denial of service attack, and the local node for you know, like Western Canada won't be overridden or now, overrun. Um, do you, uh, do you want to go on to the little bit of digging you did on the company that's running this uh, security operations center? Because there's sure. a story you, you linked in here yeah. that uh, they were also involved in some sort of data theft probe by the UK government uh, right. two years ago or so, three years yeah, ago. Yeah, so the company behind this is Atos, and they're one of the largest multinational IT services companies in Europe. Uh, they're in like 42 countries or something like that, but uh, and they have over 75,000 employees. They're one of those big, oh boy, you know, big giant boys. companies that that just sell governments, you know, magic. And then, you know, they're going to. How do I get into that business? I'd l- yeah. I I can sell magic like nobody, Alan. Yeah. <laughs> but, and and so you know they're like, oh, we're going to be all ready for this denial of service attack, and it's right. like, right, but are you really? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's like you're going to pass your simulated one you're going to do, but uh, but 
Atos uh, was the subject of a government inquiry uh, after a USB memory stick with right. passwords and usernames from an important government computer system were found on the ground in a car park or a parking lot. Maybe as like bait or as a mistake? Yeah, as in somebody was carrying and dropped you know, it. very important information around and dropped it. On their keychain or something, probably. Yeah. Well, I mean, they're a, they're a specialty security firm, so uh, you yeah. would expect they would know better than that. You would think that they well, would they be... have 75,000 employees, and I'm sure not all of them are that great. At... No, I know. That's why you don't issue stuff on USB thumbsticks. You have a no USB thumbstick policy or something, I would think. Yes. Well, first... it, you know, that harkens back to the last story. If you, know, if you have a, a sensitive industrial control system, then not only should you have a no USB stick policy, but the USB port should be disabled. <laughs> yes, I was going to say. I was going to say, you know? just turn off USB. I mean, yeah. you might have to go PS2 for your mouse and keyboard, but you'll somehow survive. Yeah, or something. Go Bluetooth. I don't know. Yeah, um, and you know you can literally go in the BIOS and disable USB, or use an operating system like Linux or whatever, and make sure that only the root user can actually access USB devices. Yeah, now that's an interesting thing. That's one of the people have often asked, so "What do you guys like about Linux or Unix over Windows?" And being able to restrict what users can mount file systems or have access to devices like that I just by starting. I think in later versions of Windows, like uh, Server two thousand eight. Yeah. And, With group and policy. Uh, I think so. Yeah, I Vista, think you can or uh, seven anyway. That we, you can, at you can manage. You level, can manage a lot of that stuff through group policy for yeah. sure. Absolutely. But the way but it's done under it, Unix and Linux is by group memberships, and to me that just seems to be a much more scalable and elegant solution. Because yeah. to me, group policy always just turns into this massive mess. I could save yes. that for another show. Especially suppose, you know when you get layers of them, and then you have the. Uh, yeah, I, I taught a whole class on just how you layer all your group yeah. policies and in what order they right. take effect and, and how certain ones can override certain other ones. and how Right, whereas in the, the Unix approach is, do I want them in this group, yes or no? And then they have it or they don't have it. Right. And it, it, yeah, it and is a little simpler. It, it, it's more that, you know, in the, with the Windows group policy, there's always, you know, some way where they might be able to mount the device, mm -hmm. right? Or mm -hmm. Windows decides that, that device isn't a USB remote storage, it's an MP3 player or something, and decides that you can mount it. Well, the other problem with that is that it is, at, at, at the, with group policy, in most cases, what it really is is a restriction that's enforced by registry settings, yeah. often the time, often the case. Yep. And there is that's, just simply, there is just ways around that, where instead of something that's just, that is enforced at the user permission level, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I mean, we could do, maybe we'll do, maybe we should do a little thing on group policy at some point in the future, because uh, it sounds mm -hmm. like there might be some material here. So if people are interested, let us know in the comments or send us an email at techsnap at jupiterbroadcasting.com. Yeah, I have a bunch, I used to teach a class on it, so I can talk all day about group policies. Alan, you have uh, any other thoughts on the uh, story there? Um, not much other stuff. Uh, the operations center will have a permanent staff of 180 employees, which hmm. seems like quite a few. Yeah. Uh, especially permanent. It's like you think they would have some people they would only need for the actual Olympics, but... Yeah, they'll just fire them. They're permanent until they get fired after the Olympics. Right. It's, it's for the event, but it yeah. means that, well, you know, the event's uh, not for a while yet. Yeah, that's true. I will. I guess they've got to start leeching them. To, I mean, uh, working on the problem uh, as fast as possible, as soon as possible. Yeah. So, it, honestly, a lot of this just seems like a giant money grab by Atos around the news of, oh, there's all these cyber attacks going mm -hmm. on. Mm -hmm. We've got to protect the Olympic webpage, so... We're going to need X hundred million dollars to, and we'll keep the website up. Nothing like take advan taking advantage of a market opportunity there, Alan. That's what they're doing. Uh, <laughs> but uh, a, uh, a promising quote uh, from them is that another key principle is to keep mission, uh, mission critical game systems quite isolated from anything that's web facing. Well, that's a good. Uh, that's a pretty so good fundamental very much security. Partitioned practice. and separated, thus yeah. makes it very hard for an external attacker to succeed at interrupting, you know, the recording of the scores. Right. Right. Absolutely. So, All right. Okay. That's that's how it should be, but you know, let's see how they actually do it compared to how they talk about it, right? Mm -hmm. We're gonna get more than just lip service about <laughs> Now it's gonna be great is if during the Olympics we come onto TechSnap and we we have a story about something getting hacked. Because now we'll have this to look back on and this discussion. So when they do that we, you know now something's gonna happen too. Because they're making such a stink out of it and it's these jerk wads that are doing it too. So you know somebody's just gonna make a statement. It's gonna be great. <laughs> I can't wait to talk about that. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, all right now uh, any other thoughts on that story? Nope. All right, then before we move on to the feedback, let's take a quick pause here and say holler to our good friends over at GoDaddy.com. Yes. Now, 
GoDaddy's got a couple of specials for the folks that watch TechSnap for the month of December, and we want to mention yeah. them right up front because they're really great deals. Yes, TechSnap people get all the love. Yeah, so uh, here's the one that I think I want to tell you about the most. Use the code TechSnap17 if you're getting a domain this month. It does expire by December 31st, and you get free private registration. That's a ten. That's a ten dollar value, and there's no quantity limit. So if you're buying like five domains. Or you're getting a .com or .org and .net of something, get the private registration. It's free, people. And I'm save $50 you. by using our code. Yeah, yeah that'd be really great. Uh, also, uh, if you're just out in the town and you're shopping for a domain, you can use the code TechSnap10 Seven. to save 10% and TechSnap20 to save 20% on shared hosting. Yep. Or TechSnap7 to get the domain for $7.49. That's true. You could do that. Or you could do uh, uh, TechSnap11 to get $1.99 hosting for three months. Uh, yeah, I'm serious. Yeah. $1.99 hosting for, for but three months. Like we talked about a week or two ago, the private registration is very helpful if you, know, you don't want people to be able to build a profile by just piecing together different bits of information about you. you know, if, if you've ever Googled yourself... And saw how much information about you is out there. Right. You know, you don't want to get any more out there. So using private registration means or, that. Or go find one of those online who is services and put your domain name in there. And, uh, yeah. you know, you'd be surprised at uh, how much information is on there if you haven't used that private registration. So you should always use the private registration. Might as well get it for free while you can. Again, that is uh, TechSnap17 to get that. And if you want the $1.99 uh, hosting for three months, that's TechSnap11. So uh, mm -hmm. thanks, to te uh, thanks to GoDaddy for their support of TechSnap. See, I got it right. I almost got it wrong. That yeah, time. you got it wrong the other week. <laughs> I know. I know. It's because I get in a groove, man, and I just, mm -hmm. you know, I just go into autopilot. But uh, we do sincerely thank uh, GoDaddy because they're making my full-time uh, employment here for Jupiter Broadcasting possible. And uh, whenever they support fine independent programming like this, we're much obliged. All right, cool. Alan, let's jump into the TechSnap feedback. <laughs> And welcome to the TechSnap Feedback segment. Thank you for emailing us, techsnap at jupiterbroadcasting.com. Mm -hmm. This week, we're going to kick off the feedback segment with a war story. Now, I know exactly what happened here, Alan, because it's the same thing that happens to me. Somebody mm -hmm. brought something up either in an email or in the IRC chat room that made you remember this entire story, didn't they? Yes. I Because I you know, what happens is when you live through this stuff, it's, you don't walk away thinking, that's going to be a plucky story I'll share one day. You walk away thinking, oh my God, I'm finally done. Yes. And you just want to forget about it. You know what I mean? Yes. So you don't really like, think about telling I it hope later on. that never happens again. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So then later, when some time has passed and somebody brings it up, you can reflect on it. And then you can share some of the good details and some of the bad right. details. It's just like, you know, some weeks we're getting ready for TechSnap and I'm like, what good war story could I tell? And I think, and I, think and I can't think of any. No, and then yeah. No. And randomly then in just, the chat room, somebody mentions something yeah. and it's like, that reminds me of this time, Matt. Yeah. Blah, yeah. blah, blah, blah. <laughs> I should say thanks to the chat room over at jblive.tv. We do this at 1 p.m. Pacific on Thursdays. And thanks to Alan over at scaleengine.com for providing the live stream, which is for sure. awesome. Let's you stream this bad boy in VLC or uh, on your iPhone or Android or devices. Android, Go over yeah. to jblive.tv. We also have the jblive.am audio stream if you want to tune in and listen to it live. All right, Alan, let's, uh, let's talk about this war story. What happened here? I okay. noticed the, one of the first things on the line, um, the, it's, it's titled as Alan's RM-RF slash war story. Yes. I'm a little worried that you're telling me you might have accidentally deleted your file system. That's exactly what happened. <laughs> oh, no. No, no, yeah. Alan. Oh, no. Okay. So first caveat is this was a, quite a while ago. I, I was definitely a junior sysadmin at the time. I was, you know... A little bit more than the new, but... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I would guess, I would guess. Yeah. Yeah. So this, uh, back uh, when I was in high school, I started an IRC shell provider, and I ran that uh, for quite a few years. It actually helped me get through college, keeping me fed and so on. <laughs> uh, so it started out as a little homebrew server on a 128 kilobit uh, co-location, <laughs> so it's barely faster than dial-up. <laughs> But all I had at home was dial-up, so right. it was fast. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and that eventually grew. We got faster connection, and then we got more servers. And, you know, at its peak, Shell Fusion has, like, nine dedicated servers and four different data centers. Nice. Shell Fusion. Uh, but as you can imagine, especially being an IRC shell provider, mm. uh, IRC, especially back then, was a lot bigger and was basically the home of hacking. Yeah. And uh, so these shell accounts and, and bouncers, which is... Uh, 
a system that lets you go on IRC and hide your IP address. Mm. Those were especially popular with people that were doing things that they didn't want traced back to them. Sure. Uh, so, you know, lots of people trying to attack the servers or hack into them or, you know, get an account and then try to root the server and so on and so on. Uh, of course, it always made me laugh when they would grab the latest Red Hat exploit and then try it against my FreeBSD 4 machine. <laughs> so even back like, then, you were a big FreeBSD guy. I love it. Well, yeah, uh, it was always more popular in the shell provider space because it, oh. wasn't Red, because it wasn't Red Hat and it didn't have quite as many exploits against it. Ah, oh, uh, sure. But also, you know, it was just the very first shell I ever bought happened to be on a FreeBSD 2 machine and that's just kind of what I started with and got used to. Mm -hmm. And so when it was time to get into it myself, that's what I started with and, and that's just where I went. Gotcha. I never really... Uh, you were happy. It, you were happy where you yeah. landed. If yeah. if I had started with Linux, I might never have got into BSD and, and would be a Linux guy right now. Huh. But luck luckily, that's not what happened. Oh, luckily. Okay, okay. <laughs> All right. So uh, now yeah. I'll say this, though. Uh, so far, everything sounds good. I'm not seeing where you just went off and deleted your file system here. Right. So one of those exploits, the, the Red Hat exploits that somebody was trying, uh -huh. uh, involved them making a symbolic link to Slash. Right? So often, like, slash var, slash temp, slash stupid name, you know, they buried it and they had a symbolic oh, no, to slash. Alan. And uh, it had an obfuscated name. And I don't remember exactly what it was, but it was something like dot, space, space, right? So that when you do an LS, it appears above dot and dot, dot. So you, most people just skip the first couple lines because mm -hmm. they know that that's just dot and dot, dot, right? Mm -hmm. So if there's one above that that starts with dots or spaces, then it, it kind of, you know, A, if you don't do the minus A, it doesn't show up in your LS, and B, you know, most people just ignore it. Yeah. Uh, but after the spaces, it had a bunch of, like, unprintable Unicode characters, right? So it's really, you know, a pain to try to target that file. Uh -oh. So as part of the cleanup, I went to remove that symbolic link. You're like, I'm going to get this sucker. Well, I'm just, I'm going to get rid of it. Uh, yeah. Because it was, had special characters and stuff, I used the shell's tab complete to type it out, right? Instead of trying to escape yep. all the characters right, and deal right. with right. ridiculousness. Uh, now, admittedly, I, was, I have this bad habit of using rm-rf even when I'm deleting things that are no directory. Okay. I mean, I, I can kind of get with that because you're like, well, I, just, just, I just want it done. I'm just well, you, you rm it. Well, you know, I don't have it turned on, but a lot of people's shells have that minus i alias for rm where it mm -hmm. asks you about each, yes or no for each file. Mm -hmm. if you that's don't put, a, that's annoying. That. Who wants that? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, but mostly it's just like every time you go to delete a directory and it says that's a directory and you're like, oh, I have to do minus R. It's just sometimes I just do minus RF, right? Sure, yeah. Uh, but somehow uh, after the... <laughs> somehow. Uh, either the shells to have complete or I. I, I don't know which one it really no, was. No. This is a long time ago. It right, could have right. been me. It Maybe. could have been me. Probably not. But though. it might have been the shell. Probably uh, totally was the shell, Alan. I'm sure. Yeah. Put a slash after the symbolic link. Okay. Okay. Right? Because it, it was a link to a directory. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, you tab complete it and it puts a slash so that you can tab complete a file that's in that directory. Uh huh. But so when I hit enter to remove it, because it had the slash at the end, rather than removing the symbolic link, the shell resolved the symbolic link and removed the target, which would be slash, yeah. the root of the file system. Yeah. Yeah. So no I knew Alan. something was wrong within one or two seconds because it didn't return to the command drop right away. Right. It sat there running. Because now all of a sudden like, the command you just ran was missing. <laughs> yeah. Well, it just... <laughs> it was just running, right? And, and yeah, that sucks. Figure out what was going on. Error messages start popping up. First, you know, can't delete slash bin slash TCSH because it's in use. Because that was the <laughs> shell I was running. Uh... <laughs> And then it's like, we'll not delete slash boot slash kernel. So because you start it's seeing these error messages tick off on the screen? Is yeah. that what you, Oh, God. Yeah. <laughs> uh, won't delete the kernel because it's flagged as system immutable. <laughs> right? And, and I just felt all the blood drain out of my yep. face. <laughs> oh, my God. And, and I broke out in a cold sweat. And I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> so I control C to stop it. It was like to prevent anything else from getting deleted. Right, right. Uh, but things are already pretty far gone, right? Slash ETC gone slash bin is empty except for the one file it couldn't delete oh no <laughs> um so all i had left was my shell but i you know i didn't even have ls so i i couldn't really <laughs> tell what was still left <laughs> you couldn't even evaluate the damage yeah 
<laughs> and wow. this server had at least 100 customers on it. And at the time, I had an uptime of like 175 days that I was really banking on, right? Back in the day, shell provider uptimes was like how people decided which one to buy their shell from. Oh, right, right. right. So that number, you know, being the company that had like eight servers that all had over 100 days was our a big, big deal. So what did you do? I mean, were you, were you, I mean, <laughs> so did it cross your mind like, maybe I can hit control Z? Did like anything like that, like anything just absolutely desperate cross your mind? Yeah. Uh, luckily, because of proper disaster planning on my part, oh okay, we had daily Bacula backups to a remote server. Good man. We had uh, 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 another server. Uh, the server that this happened on was called Sovereign, uh, <laughs> because back then I named all my servers after classes of Star Trek ships. Good man. Yep. Uh, so our our backup server had uh, backups of all of our shell servers. And that was that server itself actually didn't host uh, customer accounts, so that oh. it wouldn't get infected or yeah, hacked yeah, or anything. Yeah. That way, we have backups. Uh, so I go over to that server, get into the Bacula console, and restore slash etc slash boot and slash bin. Uh, then now I finally have ls back and everything, uh, and I did a verify slash compare backup to figure out what other files were missing and restored them. Nice. Luckily, I caught it before it deleted too much. Yeah. Um, so I, I got everything restored uh, from that the backup that had run 1 a.m. the day before or that day or you know. Uh, amazing thing was that I pulled all of this off without having to reboot, so I didn't lose my uptime. I was going to ask about that. Uh, no customers <laughs> complained. <gasps> no, because you know they unless, they were, unless they were logged in and tried to do ls during that short amount they of time, notice. then they would notice. So the total time from the disaster which was me deleting slash, and the recovery was less than an hour. Man, I know. you hadn't I've, deleted that many files. I have been in a situation where I have deleted an important directory before and have felt that, oh, no, I just, I just deleted that customer's thing. Yeah, you know, and it's I just, remember uh, I was doing something with reconfiguring the network, or the firewall, right? Mm -hmm. And I typed the command, I press enter, and the cursor doesn't move to the next line. Hmm. And you know you've just gotten just, disconnected. You just feel your face turn yep. red. You know, I just firewalled myself out of yep. the box. Yep, and now you're stuck because your best, your your most likely, unless you have something in another network you can get to. The server is in another yeah. country, and it's too late for the support people. Yeah, and, and 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 those support guys hate it when you call them up and go, "I need you to connect this box to the console port on my firewall. I have to get into my server," and they just hate that. Yeah. So, and, and you know that's why it's always been my thing to, uh, the firewall is always managed. Uh, you add new rules on the fly, mm -hmm. but don't add them on reboot until they've been running on the fly perfectly well for a while. That's a good tip. That way, when that happens, remote reboot firewalls back to the way it was before. Man, the last system I was working on, the guy did just that, too. He had stuff that took effect at boot that didn't, wasn't in effect while it was running. Threw me for a loop because the systems had been running for like 180 days beforehand, so no one thought right. about it. I mean, after 180 days of, with no one messing with the firewall settings, you don't think of that. Yeah, so you're right. It's a good. So thing. yeah, you you, uh, you have to make sure that you have change management, right? And you have to you know have a reminder set to tell yourself, all right, after a week, check, make sure everything's mm. happy, and then make that apply after reboot from now on. Because yeah, if 180 days later it reboots and all of a sudden it doesn't have that important firewall rule, you're like, why is this breaking? Mm -hmm. I fixed this 100. Nobody's touched the machine in 180 days. Why is it not working anymore? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Man. Well, I'm glad that story turned out for the good, though, for the better. I yes. mean, you got that back. I, I'm glad. You know, that was one of those war stories where I could have, I would have been very happy to just keep it to myself and never tell anybody <laughs> that I made such a mistake. Uh, but it was a good war story, yeah. and since n nothing was actually harmed, it's not necessarily a horrible story. And uh, geez, I didn't realize you've been using Bacula for a long time. Bacula yes. saving the bacon. Yeah, from like I started with like 1.3. Yeah. Up to like 5.3 now. <laughs> Man, I think that's about when I was using it back. And that's almost the last time I would have used it. Uh, should we jump on to some of the emails? Yes, we got lots of good emails. Yeah, we do. All right. So the first one comes from Matt. And he says, hey, guys, I listened to TechSnap 28 and 34 about the ZFS server build. Now I'm a little confused. How is Alan's ZFS server configured if ZFS will do all of the RAID stuff and he's using RAID Z2 for the RAID 6 option? Why are his drives on an Adaptech RAID controller? 
And mm -hmm. how is that adapt tech configured? Now we got this question a lot actually. Yes. A lot of people have this question because they well, they noticed specifically because in TechSnap twenty eight I said don't use a RAID controller. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And then, text, <laughs> and then after the in like TechSnap thirty two and thirty four I was like yeah here's the specs for my server where I bought this fancy five hundred dollar adapt tech RAID right. control. Right. And and so people thought that was a bit of a discrepancy, and yes. uh, so that's a great question to answer because I think there's yes. probably a few people that wondered. So okay, yeah. so, what's, so we got what's that the question deep? quite a bit uh, because you know using a RAID controller is contrary to what I said during uh, the ZFS episode. Right, right. Uh, in this case, I didn't actually really have a choice. Oh. I needed a RAID. Con I needed a uh, a host bus adapter or some kind of disk controller that would work under BSD. Right. I wanted something that had good BSD drivers. Right, uh, and so Adaptech actually makes their own drivers for it based on the FreeBSD drivers. But you wouldn't have necessarily had to put them in any kind of RAID. Couldn't you have just used nope. it as a straight controller? Right. Uh, so the motherboard has uh, an onboard Intel controller. Yeah, okay. Uh, but that only has six ports, yeah. and it's SATA, not SAS. Right. Uh, and I was using two of those ports for the OS drives. Oh, uh, okay. Right. On top of the eight SAS drives for ZFS, right. we actually have... Two mirrored uh, drives. That's how I like to do it too. For uh, that are running UFS. Well, you can use ZFS as your root file system, but I just didn't want to, and I wanted the separate I/O for things like log yep. files. Yep, exactly. I didn't want log files to be lagging up the ZFS array. Well, and if for whatever reason, you know, if there was some sort of trouble with your larger array, which is just more likely to happen when you have a larger amount of disks, yep. uh, you know, your OS can still boot up, which exactly. is always a good thing. Exactly. Uh, and yeah, so, so those two dedicated OS drives, even though the Intel adapter itself does RAID, but it's an onboard controller, but it's mm -hmm. a server motherboard, so it's okay. Mm -hmm. uh, I actually used uh, GOM, the FreeBSD software RAID. Yeah, okay. Uh, which actually ties into one of the other questions we'll talk about in a minute. Uh, the Adaptech adapter also had the advantage of its unique uh, battery backup I do like thing that. that we talked about. Yeah, a uh, solid state thing. But yeah, so I needed a controller that would handle the eight SAS drives and work with FreeBSD. So I, I got the Adaptech. Uh, I have the Adaptech configured to pass through each of the drives separately. Uh, so each one is just a, a, a volume. There's no RAID going on in the, in the Adaptech. Oh, so you're not using its built-in RAID capabilities? No. That's, that's so, what I was going to ask you. I'm like, why aren't yeah, you just doing pass-through? Right. It's, it's overly expensive. I probably could have gotten one that uh, a, a different model that had no RAID capabilities and with just a host bus adapter. Well, you're using it in a customer expensive. production environment with customer data. It's almost worth it just to have that cache. That, that, yeah, you well, know, that cool cache outage. thing and the fact that it has up-to-date FreeBSD drivers and it was, you know, their newest top-of-the-line product. And high performance. Just, well, and you needed yeah. SAS, too. Well, the other thing is I wanted SAS 6G, not 3G. Mm -hmm. So I didn't buy one of the cheaper, older ones. Yeah. And if for some other reason, which I doubt you ever would, but if for some re reason you wanted to switch back to UFS, or later on you wanted to use that storage array on a different piece of equipment, you would have right. that option to do it, and then you could rate exactly. it for some reason. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, yeah. So the Adaptech passes through each drive separately as a separate device to ZFS without any RAID, and then ZFS deals with the drives individually, making the RAID Z2 array. Mm. Uh, as I said during the initial episode, you don't actually want to back your ZFS with a RAID device. So you, what you don't want to do is create a RAID 0 array or a RAID 5 or 6 array and then have that, that will show up in your OS as just one device and, have, and yeah. then you would add that as a single ZFS mm -hmm. because you're losing half the capabilities of ZFS. Mm -hmm. right? ZFS can't know, all right, when you say copies equals 2 on this file, I should store the two copies on different physical devices. But if it only sees you as having one physical device from your RAID controller, it won't be able to do that. And so it won't be able to take advantage of a lot of its stuff. Right. A lot of the cool features that ZFS has. Yeah, can or, you know, the ability, to, ZFS has the ability to swap out a device, right? You can, yeah. hook up, you can hook up a replacement device, say, move everything from this drive to the replacement one, and then pull it out. Even if you have, like, a RAID 0, where you can't lose any devices or it'll take out the whole array, you can actually replace a device with ZFS as long as you connect the old and the new at the same time. Right, if you have a spare controller that slot, that is so cool. You can so it'll be like it'll just start exactly. RAID zero mirroring to the new drive, and then once it's done, right. it's like all right, you can yeah, take so that. Yeah, so it'll it'll resilver the live drive to the spare. Oh man! And switch over, and then you can pull out the one. I have never had more geek lust for a file system than I have for ZFS. I yeah. mean, every time we talk about it, I just want to give ZFS a big sloppy kiss. <laughs> So if I had done, like he asked, if I had just done a, a big RAID 0, making one device out of all eight hard drives, and then expose that to ZFS, 
uh, I wouldn't have been able to create a Z2 array because that requires at least three devices. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, and also, because with RAID 0, if one device dies, the entire array is lost, so that would have caused my entire ZFS to disappear if one hard drive died. And the whole point of Z2 <laughs> was the fact that we could handle two drives dying without any problems. Right. <laughs> Well, there you go. Well, good. I'm glad. So that that clears it up for me, too, because I had been wondering the same thing. Yeah. Um, anything so, else yeah. on that question? I, I, I picked the Adaptech driver on purpose, even though it <laughs> sounded like it, it was contrary to what I had proposed. Uh, so you don't need to buy a RAID controller at all. You can avoid it. Uh, I just did because I needed something that did SAS, because the onboard one didn't, mm -hmm. and that ran with FreeBSD. Uh, and, you know, so I couldn't just buy a cheap uh, host bus adapter somewhere. And you, know, you want something uh, that, I mean, when you say yeah. runs with FreeBSD, I mean, you want something that has a track record of good BSD yeah. support because it's a critical component to your structure. Yes, like where the company actually writes their own open source yeah. drivers. They have a history of commitment. Yeah. yeah. No, I totally get you there. Because that's the, mm -hmm. that's the and when you're using these open source operating systems, that's really what you have to go by is their track record. Yeah. And, uh, all right. It's the same reason why all of our servers only ever have Intel or Broadcom network cards. Mm, interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Should we because go on to Graham's question? All right, so Graham writes in, he says, I'm looking to do a RAID setup, but I would like to know if I need two hard drives to be the same make or model, or can they be two hard drives of the same size, but not necessarily made by the same vendor or the yeah. same model? Uh, what do you think of that, Alan? Uh, so while if you're doing RAID, uh, the two drives don't actually have to be the same model or the same manufacturer or the same size. It is best if they are, though. I agree, uh, yeah. Especially when, when you're you using them in a, in, a, in a commercial product like a yeah. ReadyNAS or a Drobo. Uh, yes. They generally don't have... Um, well, the Drobo is kind of meant for doing different sizes. Yeah, yeah. No, stuff, totally, I agree. But if you can keep them... I, you know, because I have, I have two Drobos, and mm -hmm. I have noticed that when, you know, the drives are the same size, it just seems to be like the Drobo... Everything is just a little... The Drobo, like, well, sometimes when, I have mis, when I've had mismatched uh, um, makes of hard drives in a Drobo... The Drobo will sometimes incorrectly identify a drive as damaged. And what I have found out is what matters more is some of these drives have firmwares that, like, have weird sleep settings on them and things like that that make these RAID controllers freak out. So if you, yep. find, if you identify one brand and model as compatible, then you just, you're, you're better chances of success. Yeah. Uh, but specifically, if you're doing striping or mirroring, which are basically your only options when you only have two drives... Uh, the performance is dictated by the slower of the two drives, right? If you're doing mirroring, then it has to write to both drives at the same time, and the write isn't finished until it's finished on both drives. Mm -hmm. So if one drive's a lot faster than the other, it ends up having to wait around. If you're writing two blocks, it has to wait around until the first block is done on the second drive before they can both start on the next block. Word. Yeah. Uh, and so identical drives mean that one drive won't constantly be waiting for the other. They'll have more even wear that way as well. Mm -hmm. uh, also, issues of timing. If you're doing a lot of stuff, then you don't want one drive to constantly be slower than the other ones. Yeah, the chat room right now is talking about those uh, green drives. And, you know, yeah. you got to be careful with those green drives if you have the right Green equipment. drives are meant for desktop and office computers mm -hmm. that where Hard. the hard drive is going to be asleep half the time that it's on. Yeah, yeah. Um, They're really not meant for servers. The Drobo at all. folks have have tweaked the Drobo to work better with the green drives. And one, the one advantage to the green drives, and I'm not recommending you get them, but the one advantage because they're slower is they're also cooler. So if you have them really packed into some place, they do run slightly cooler than some of the more faster drives. Yeah. Um, Bill, we got an email here from Bill. You want me to go to that? Well, one? Um, I'm not quite finished yet. Okay, go ahead. Uh, yeah. So you can have issues with timing when the drives are very different performance-wise. Uh, however, depending on your configurations, it's sometimes possible to actually uh, take advantage of the fact that instead of both drives acting as the slowest one, where you could actually uh, get the faster speed from the second drive. Mm -hmm. um, for example, with FreeBSD's software RAID, the, the GOM RAID that we use uh, for the ZFS server, the mirroring mode supports a bunch of different balancing methods. Interesting. Uh, the default is round robin. So mm -hmm. when mm -hmm. it's time to read, it'll read from the first block from the first device and the second block from the second device and back and forth, right? So that when you're reading a file, you're going to get the speed of both drives. Yeah. Now, if you're reading and writing a lot at the same time, remember that both drives have to do every write. They can kind of become uneven. Uh, there's prefer mode where you can say always read from the, this one of the two devices or one of the however many devices, 
right? So this device is is the one you always use, and the other one is just the backup. Oh, that's interesting. So it it takes the writes, but it never has to do any reads. Hmm. Uh, now there might be a reason for that. Uh, also, there's you know you might actually create a, an array that was one SSD and one that's spinning hard was, drive. That's exactly what I was just thinking. Yeah. And you would say you know prefer the SSD for reading all the time. Right. Right. Uh, there's split mode. Where if you're doing uh, a very large read, like if you're reading big chunks at a time, then it will actually split those chunks and read from both drives at the same time. Or what I use is load balance mode, where the next request that comes in goes to whichever the drives is least busy at the time. Nice. That's the way I would want it, too. So it just does a little logic there and just it handles the routing. Yeah. That's pretty cool. And because it's software in the OS, you get a little more control than you would with, like, the limited software that's going to be running on like an onboard or mm-hmm. even a RAID controller. Mm-hmm. That is With a real expensive to... RAID controller, you might be able to set settings like this, but the one that comes built into your motherboard, you're really not. But the software RAIDs, that is one huge advantage they have, is the level of vis- visibility you have of what's going on with your drives and your storage array yeah. in general. I agree yeah. with you. Um, all right, now any other thoughts on that one before we jump to Bill? Nope, that's about it. All right, so our last email of the day before we get to the roundup comes from Bill, and this is an interesting one, folks. Check this out. Bill writes, I'm currently designing slash developing a client-server communications platform. I would like to make the project open source when I start developing the code, but I am concerned about potential security implications. Now, this is kind of speaking to something in general about open source, so listen to this. The plan is, the plan is to use a user auth system so users can easily contact each other. This is making my security sense tingle because if you have the code for the auth system, you could break it down easily. I would love to hear your opinions about this as there are ways it could be done, but they would kill ease of use. Hmm. So he's worried, if I, did, if I create this great uh, user login system, but then I make the code open source, will it prevent an attacker from just reading the source and then just reverse engineering how the system works? Right. But if you rely on nothing more than the fact that no one knows how your security system works, which is called security through obscurity, <laughs> right. uh, then it's not really security at all. No, it's, you know? it's a hope. <laughs> it's it's yeah. hoping for the best. <laughs> it's, it's hoping that the other guy isn't smarter than you. Right, right. You know, because even if it's not open source, there's a good chance that they can figure out how it works. Well, I mean, you take a look at things like OpenSSH and OpenSSL. All of those things are open, but obviously yes. critical security things. So they're mm-hmm. able to make that dynamic work. But right. So the first thing is, rather than writing your own auth system, uh, hmm. you should look at existing libraries. Yeah, that's written a great by idea. People that are smarter than you, right? Yeah. Yeah. N- nobody goes out and writes their own implementation of SSL. They use, you know... GNU TLS or OpenSSL or one of you know the existing ones, because you know thousands of people have gone over them and, and tried to find every hole and bug that they could, and they do every single day. Yeah, uh, and then depending on exactly what you're trying to authenticate against, it might already be systems built, and that means less work as well. Hmm. You know, and there's standard libraries for encryption like AES for block. Encryption. Yeah, I was or, trying to think of what he might be trying to design where he wouldn't be able to use an existing library to do that yeah. exact thing. Yeah. So that's definitely uh, something you to know, consider. There's AES for uh, Stream Cipher. There's uh, SHA for hashing, Blowfish, and so on and so on. Uh, or authenticity libraries like GPG, right? And that's how you sign packages in most of the uh, Linux open source uh, package distribution systems or SSL and TLS, right? It's the same uh, transport encryption we use for online banking and all e-commerce, right? It's pretty well Mm -hmm. universally trusted, except for (laughs) the small issue of the certificate authorities not always doing their job. Right. So Uh, so make sure you keep watching TechSnap to get all updates on that. Yeah. But, you know, in the end, if your software is open source, then other developers can spot any mistakes you do make, and they'll either notify you about them or even contribute a patch that resolves the problem. Mm -hmm. Mm Mm-hmm. You know, so... In general, open source is always the best way. Uh, you know, people might have, people have a better chance of finding the bugs, but they have a better chance of finding the bugs sooner and telling you about them rather than them finding about the bug. And and then it's also it's just the simple fact of the matter is it's just not all on his shoulders. There's a whole community out there identifying that stuff. He can focus on the other parts of his project that he's really good at. Yep. So, but yeah, I, mean, I, uh, I think it's I think maybe that's actually what his sense is tingling and telling him is that maybe he's just a, it's got he's got the wrong approach. Yeah, maybe uh, I don't know. Maybe uh, not. Colin Percival, the uh, f- security officer for FreeBSD, has a bunch of articles on his blog about you know it's it's not just about using uh, 
standard encryption things like AES either. You have to know how to use them. Oh, yeah, good right? point. There are many different modes of AES, and if you use the wrong one, then it, it doesn't provide you with what you think it does. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. For example, one of the companies like Dropbox was using AES in codebook mode, which meant that it was fairly trivial that basically everything was encrypted with one key instead of having like cipher block chaining or anything. Uh-huh. And so it meant that it was a lot easier to, to brute force the password and, and decrypt all of the files. Right? If, you, if you broke it on one file with like a known plain text attack, then you would have it for every file rather than if it had mm-hmm. cipher block chaining where every block would be not only encrypted with the password but also encrypted with the block before it. Right, right. And so on. Interesting. So, uh, and you know, maybe we get maybe we interpret it wrong, but uh, we we encourage you to write back. If In general, if, if you're if you're worried that somebody seeing your source code is going to make it insecure, it's already insecure, and keeping it a secret is not actually going to help at all. Great way to put it. That's a great way to put it. All right, Alan. Well, there's the feedback. Yeah, is that? I think that's everything we wanted to cover there. Okay. Yes. Well, then uh, buckle up, boys and girls, because I'm putting my soapbox right here next to me, and it's time for the tech snap roundup. That music means it's time for the TechSnap Roundup. Now, the Roundup is the part of the show where we go over the stories that didn't quite fit in the main section, but we thought were still awesome. Maybe you'd want to go check the links and read up on a little more. And often are provided by links.techsnap.tv, our subreddit. Now, Alan, like uh, I mentioned at the top of the show, while we are recording this episode, they are having the SOPA hearings right now. And uh, actually, as we are going, um, I would I would classify the hearings as not going well. So far, they're just kind of voting right down the line. Everybody who's against it, is voting against amendments to make it somewhat more manageable, and people who are for it are voting for it. And, of course, the way they stacked this whole thing is there's more people for it than there are against it, so they just naturally win by having their presence there. Yep. It's unfortunate. It's like we're just talking into a vacuum. Um, so let's talk a little bit about this, because one of the things to... Uh, now, now that I think at this point, now who knows, maybe we'll be lucky and this won't pass. I'm going to wa- operate under, even if it doesn't pass, we need to ho- hold the people responsible who got this whole thing started. And one of the things I think that is being overlooked here is the Internet has become the greatest platform for information and communications around the world. It is one level of barrier to entry to get to all of the information that's on the Internet. You can be in any country, anywhere in the world, and if you can get on an Internet connection, you can get to the, you, in, in most cases, you can get to the same information anyone else can. And that is going to be the great changer of all societies around the world. World. And I know that sounds yep. like it's a really big concept, but we've never had anything like this. And the stuff that SOPA is doing is designing it so that way different people who have different opinions about the way things should be can block access for others to get to that information. And one of the people who is primarily responsible for that is the author of the SOPA bill, and that's Howard L. Berman. He is uh, out of California, the 28th Congressional District of California. Uh, one of the other things that uh, Howard's well known for is uh, he's uh, also put, put down as pressuring Iran to make sure that we move a little more aggressively on uh, our stance mm-hmm. against Iran. But let's take a look at uh, old Howard's uh, funding here. The cycle of funding for his campaign in 2011 to 2012, he's raised $1.3 million, all right? And he has $2.25 million on hand for campaign financing. I wonder who those uh, top contributors are. Well, let's look at his top five contributors. Again, this is the author of SOPA. His number one contributor, Time Warner. Second, General Electric, and of course, General Electric is all kinds NBC. of yeah, exactly. Uh, uh, uni- NBC Universal, and whatever else they've bought since, mm-hmm. which mm-hmm. owns Hulu. Yep, yep. Uh, also, uh, Gibson, Dunn, and Crutcher, Aiken Group, and also the Directors Guild of America. Of course, that'd be the Hollywood influence. Uh, he's also right. got and, the- and that that one with the three names that sounds like a law firm. It's yeah. probably some other media company who had their law firm make the donation. Now this is also interesting. Uh, the time the TV movies industry has donated one hundred and eighty three thousand dollars. Lawyers and law firms that are just kind of identified as that one hundred and thirty million dollars. Um, you know what's interesting? What's not on here is uh, tech companies. And, uh, you, know, you know, the things that are really driving our economy in the U.S. these days, they're not on there. It's these old media. And it's, it's curious that somebody who has been able to raise $2.25 million thanks to these companies, uh, he was the author of SOPA. Hmm. And it turns out he's also up for election in 2012. A lot of these people are up for election in 2012. And when SOPA passes, I think the only recourse we have as a people is just not to, uh, not to vote for these people again. 
And why not? What do we have to lose at this point? They're going to do some other awesome legislation? I doubt it. <laughs> so anyways, that's my soapbox for today. Uh, it's yeah. not over yet. It's still ongoing while we do this show, but boy, it's just... It's not looking good. Well, and th- it, this isn't just the only part of it that's that's hinky like this. You know, like a bunch of the congressional aides that helped actually write the text of these bills I have now left their work in government and work directly for these media companies now. Mm-hmm. It's you know, funny it's how... Like, uh, if, you, if you write this clause into the thing, then when you leave government service, there's this nice cushy job with a big fat signing bonus waiting for you. A, 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 an amazing place to follow up to the second things that are happening with SOPA during these hearings. And, and just after this will be reddit.com slash r slash SOPA. And uh, they're posting things there. And they're also, you know, out there, they're calling out the people who are standing up for the people and saying, hey, you know, we've heard from eBay, from Google, from Apple, from all these different companies. We don't yep. want this to happen. They've got a massive petition signed by, by Twitter and Facebook. And when Twitter and Facebook and Microsoft, like somebody said on my Twitter feed, when they all agree on one thing together, then you know it's bad. And so yep. there you have it. Yeah, all right, it's Alan. the same group of companies that were like t- telling the French government that they couldn't outlaw hashing passwords. It's like, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, this is as ludicrous as outlawing hashing passwords. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, it doesn't make any sense. Let's, and, you know, as, as further proof of the fact that these media companies are literally evil, yeah. uh, Universal Music Group, which, if you remember, uh, they're having that big thing with uh, media... Mega Upload. Mega Upload. Yeah. And Mega Upload gave them the tool to take down anything that was a copyright violation of theirs. No, on and, YouTube. Uh, well, Universal uh, Music Group had a tool to take down things from Mega Upload. Oh, oh, and, oh, oh, sorry. And they went overboard and started deleting anything they didn't like, anything right, that right. you know had anything to do. They took down completely legit- legitimate stuff that they had no right to take down, mm-hmm. uh, In- including, because, including because it had you know keywords that matched uh, their movies, including or because, podcasts. They've ta- they took down uh, Tech News Today. Uh, Which is a Twit podcast. It's, a daily it's news podcast they took down yeah. because they just played the mega upload trailer in their podcast well, where they were covering all, the story. Right. Use it, Universal Music Group had the uh, mega uploads advertising trailer uh, which was 100% made by mega upload and contained no copyright material from anybody else. Uh, Universal had that pulled off YouTube and then they had Tech News Today pulled off for playing it inside their video. And it gets worse because then Tech News Today appealed, had it put, then YouTube put it back up, and then Universal had it taken down again, I believe, as part of an automated ongoing process. And then today, at some point, it just mysteriously appeared back on YouTube again. Yeah. So. uh, uh, But basically, it's it's for the example of Universal Music Group pulling things off just because they don't like them not because it's actually any form of copyright Well, and it, it shows you that uh, we already have the tools in place to do what these people want. Yes, and, and the DMCA is broken. The fact that Universal says it's a copyright violation, so it gets taken down immediately, and then Tech News Today has to file a counterclaim saying, no, we actually own the right to everything that we showed here, or that, you know, we did fair use, we only played 30 seconds of the clip, it's... and. Furthermore, that clip is actually pro- copyright of Mega Upload, not Universal. Uh, Jupiter Broadcasting has had uh, episodes of uh, Lotso pulled down. It was our video game show we did because we'd be reviewing the video game and we'd show a click like, oh, yeah, I really love this. Like we were talking about Fallout and they had this great uh, like zoom in and slow down effect in Fallout. And we showed a clip of it with us you know, sitting in front of the screen talking about it and they pulled down the clip. Because it had those few seconds of video game footage, yeah, and, and so like, then there's no re- there's no ad if revenue. If it was for on CNN, they wouldn't have got it pulled down. No, no, it's of course not. <laughs> of course not. Uh, yeah. sh- should we move on to the because the roundup We're supposed to keep going. I know we're yes, fired up, right. but we're supposed yeah. to keep on moving. All right, an update on yep. that uh, drone that was brought down in Iran. Now, remember mm-hmm. one of the I think one of the first people that mentioned it. Uh, was uh, us that it sounded like because it had just broken when we went on air that it might have been brought down by uh, like their technical division and not by fire. Um, right. Iran has posted an update about this, and it sounds like that actually might have been what happened. Have you seen right. this? Right, uh, because, well, just from the, the pictures we saw, the drone wasn't very damaged or anything, so it's, we're, you know, it's not like it was literally shot down by a missile or something. Now, this was, uh, an, so, exclu- this was an exclusive interview with an Iranian engineer, uh, and he said that they jammed the GPS signal of the device. Now, if you remember back in the episode, they, we didn't have any information. I said... You know, a lot of these drones usually ha- use their GPS, and so if they lose their control signal by having it jammed, they'll f- use GPS to fly back to their launch point. 
Right. Right. And I said, but if you jam the UPS, it wouldn't know where to go, and it would continue to circle until it ran out of gas and then crash. The engineer said that uh, using knowledge gleaned from previous downed American drones, because they have captured uh, our drones before, yep. they uh, picked up this technique and uh, practiced it, and then were able to uh, use a spoofing technique to get the drone confused and land it. And uh, interesting that uh, Iran... You know, in, in scale to our military is very, very small. But they're able through, because it is tech, because it's becoming more of a technological warfare, they're able to respond on just as an effective scale with much, much lesser resources. And right. as this war you know, becomes it only, more... It only takes one guy to hijack a, uh, yeah. a drone. Right? Interesting. So, uh, interesting update on that. We'll have a link if you want to read more about that. But, in you know, if, if they're actually able to completely jam GPS, then that can screw with the guidance of... For example, Tomahawk cruise missiles. But that is why Tomahawk cruise missiles have terrain-following radar as well. Yeah. As a and, because, and, well, they actually had that before GPS was reliable. And now it's just, they're backed by GPS, but... And this will yeah. be one more thing they'll update, and they'll sell another drone to the government, and they'll buy it. You know, it's, it'll get yeah. fixed. Uh, let's, let's talk about this Google Wallet story that I, I caught, thanks to the uh, TechSnap yes. Reddit this week. Uh, I don't know if you heard, Alan, but there's been this big hoopla around the new Galaxy Nexus that's coming out on Verizon. It's a sweet new Android phone, runs ice cream sandwich, but it kept getting delayed. And when, when, when poked about it, Verizon came out and said, well, we have concerns about Google Wallet. And some people are saying, well, is that what's slowing up the release? Hmm and ha, what are the issues with Google Wallet? We haven't heard any complaints. Well, we've got a story this week that might be giving some of the background details on what Verizon was concerned about. Now, a security firm done, did an analysis on Google Wallet, and they claim Google Wallet leaves sensitive, unencrypted data on your phone, uh, including images of potential, of, uh, including partial images of credit cards, and uh, maybe even ones you removed from the Google Wallet system, they'd still be on there. And right. So it sounds like. Like most applications on phones or even on your desktop, it has a little SQLite database it uses to keep a history, right? So you can open up your Google wallet and see all the transactions you've done. Yeah. Uh, now, like most websites, it, keeps, it doesn't keep your whole credit card number, but it keeps the last four digits so that when you have three credit cards, you know which one was which mm -hmm. and things like that. But it also seems it keeps a bit more data than maybe is necessary. And yeah. the fact that after you remove a card, it doesn't remove it, but... At the same time, if it deleted all your history for that card, you might not want that either, right? And I actually think Google might have fixed this in an update. If you read the article, it sounds like that history thing was a bug. The other thing that Google pointed out is these researchers were testing on a rooted phone, so they're able to get access to isolated areas of Android that otherwise normal applications right, and users wouldn't be able to get. But at the same to. time, if That's it's kind on of the security phone, through obscurity, right? Kind of, yeah. It's just, well, normal users can't get there. It's like, yeah, but it's on the on the on the storage on the phone, so yeah. it, it so it's there. should be secured. Yeah, yeah exactly. But uh, it sounds like know, it might have been updated. It, that, that, those database files could literally just be password protected, like encrypted with your, your phone unlock password at least or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so that, or, you know, a, a Google Wallet password so that you have to enter a password every time you go to use your Google Wallet, but then that can hurt usability. And especially I'm not if you sure. Want, you know, I'm if sure. you want near field communication so you can wave your phone at the. Yeah, I the don't know how I feel on all of that stuff, to be honest with you. But I'm sure Google, Google wants people to use this, so they're going to get this security thing locked down. I'm, yeah, I'm not too worried sure. about that. I mean, but yeah, it is a bump in the road, and it, it is kind of like something to be aware of. It was an oversight to have quite that much data stored in the database. Under the assumption that people aren't going to root their phone because, you know, here at TechSnap, we're an advocate of the fact that you we very much so are. So yeah. that, you know, you have more an idea of what's going on and more control over the device. It's, it, 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 to me, it is as absolute as asinine as it would be to buy a PC and not have administrative access to it. You just, you wouldn't do it. You just don't do it. Yeah. It's, or like buying a car where you're not allowed to drive it, they drive it for you. Where the hood is welded shut, Alan. Uh, yeah. All right, let's talk about this next story on the, uh, on the Roundup because it's a good guy Google story, and we just beat yeah. on Google every now and then, so I wanted to give a good guy story when they've earned it. Uh, Google has given away uh, 550,000 uh, 550, pounds to uh, Which is a about park. Eight, yeah, it's, uh, it's about $850,000 US, yeah. and that was to Bletchley Park, which is a uh, computer history museum. Yeah, like uh, where some of the first uh, like World War I or II codes were cracked, and uh, you know, yes. it's a real... Uh, it's, it's, they they built the uh, first computer uh, before ENIAC in the U.S., but it was so classified that they couldn't tell anybody about it. And then you said you got an email. I got the same email from Google saying yeah. they're donating like fifty thousand dollars. No, forty or fifty million dollars to a bunch of different charities oh. uh, for Christmas. Well, there you go. So so there you go. See, we we sometimes we we harp on Google, but when they do a good guy thing, we want to talk about it too. 
Yeah, uh, Google is big, but you know they are a lot less evil uh, for their size than a lot of other big evil corporations. So whenever people start talking about hacks and attacks from China hackers, everybody gets all up in a tiffy. And uh, there was a story that came out from an uh, uh, ISP in uh, where was it, Alan? This is your story. Well, through in it's here. not anywhere specific. So oh, Ibon okay. is uh, an ISP that specifically targets hotels. So they provide oh, I see. at two hotels for the guests. To use. Gotcha. And uh, the idea here is that you get an account with Ibon, and then no matter what hotel you're at, in you know their service area or whatever, you get access. You you can use. So you pay. You know, if you ever try to use the internet at a hotel, it's like fifteen dollars a day, or, or something ridiculous. So yes. if you can pay a, if you have to travel a lot and you can pay a flat rate to Ibon to have a, internet access at all the hotels, then that can be an advantage for you. Uh, now there's now there was a news story that came out. Uh, went on Bloomberg, which is uh, business news. Uh, they say they had a source in uh, the U.S. in a U.S. intelligence agency saying that the Chinese hackers had broke into Ibon and sold some customer data. Ah, and so now, that's I, what they're denying. Yeah, and Ibon is denying that that happened, saying they have no proof that they were attacked. But as we've said before, that's not how it works. You don't. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have proof we were attacked, right. or we don't have proof that they stole this specific information. You assume you got yeah. hacked, and they got yeah. everything until you can prove otherwise. People just have right? to keep getting hit over the head. You can't prove a negative. You can't yeah. prove you weren't hacked. <laughs> it's, it's unbelievable. So, um, all right. So uh, all the links to all of those in the show notes and uh, all of that good stuff. Now, that's kind of bringing us to the end of the show here. Alan, is there any business we want to attend to before we wrap up? Um, not really. All right, I want to give a mention to the holiday book pick that we have for TechSnap for a little okay. reading if you have some downtime, and it just happens to fit in so damn perfectly with all this SOPA stuff, and that is The Master Switch, The Rise and Fall of the Information Empires uh, by, by Tim Wu. Link to that in the show notes, and if you use that link, we get a percentage of the purchase, and that supports Jupiter Broadcasting. There's also a link if you want to grab an Audible book, which is how I listen to this, and I absolutely recommend that. And then you just go over to jupiterbroadcasting.com, Find the latest episode of TechSnap and scroll down to the bottom of the show post, and uh, that links to all that stuff is there, as well oh, as links to RSS yeah, feeds. If you I had a book uh, for that, and you'll have to get the affiliate links and stick them in the show notes. But uh, sure, no problem. Cory Doctorow's little brother. Oh yeah, okay. It's about the the government's kind of a big brother, you know. It's it's and it's about these kids that use their um, Xboxes to create. A, a private network that they can communicate on encryptedly. Awesome. And so they have to have uh, like a GPG key signing party. <laughs> and, uh, and that, is that on this, Amazon? Yeah. Cool. And uh, yeah, I think you can get it on Audible too. Uh, also, you can get, I'm pretty sure you can get the text for free under Creative Commons from the website as well. Yeah, Corey's great like that. Yeah, because yeah. uh, he used to work for the EFF. But um, everybody has these uh, identification cards that they use for like the subway so the government can track where everybody goes. Like a national ID kind of thing. Yeah, and they're RFID. So these kids make a little scrambler that so they can like walk by and swap somebody's ID with somebody else's. <laughs> so they swap all the different people's IDs. <laughs> so then the government starts randomly arresting people for, for going outside their expected behavior. It's like, oh, you live man. here and here. Why are you going from here to here on the subway? It's like because somebody switched my card. Terrorism! That and, is... Yeah, that's a good read, and right. and then you know the the black helicopters come and and so on and so on. But it's a really good read, and it covers it's it's because Cory Doctor actually knows about this stuff, mm -hmm. the technicalities of the way the encryption stuff works and mm -hmm. the key signing is all real. I've read some of his stuff, and it is an absolute joy to read. For, for yes, uh, he writes very good sci-fi, but mm -hmm. this is like near future, and well, I will definitely read that. All then. realistic, like, awesome. Uh, like a lot of his stuff is really like sci-fi, but this one is all, you know, this could happen and all the science behind it is real. Man, I'd love to talk to Corey someday. I really respect his work and he's a good thinker. So, Alan, yeah. that's a great pick. So links to that will be in the show notes as well, too. All right. Well, I think that just about wraps up this week's episode of TechSnap. Alan, thanks for another great show, man. No problem. All right, everyone. Well, TechSnap is streamed live on Thursdays and then released for download Friday morning over at jupiterbroadcasting.com in just about every format you'd ever want. Audio for you commuters and HD for you home theater viewers and then everything in between as well as RSS feeds for each one of those formats. So go grab those so you can get the show automatically every week that we release it. All right, everyone. Well, thanks so much for tuning in to this week's episode of TechSnap, and we'll see you right back here next week.